As uh, most of you know, I made a I made a purchase, or I'm in the process of purchasing a vehicle truck, Susie and I, and uh, I had somebody that knew more about it than I did the other day, and there was there was a little option that I didn't realize existed, and it's this little pull button. There's the four-wheel drive. When in the old days, you had to get out of your truck in the mud hole and turn the hubs. Well, now they got this little knob in the dashboard. That's the last four-wheel drive truck I had. You had to get out and turn hubs. That was in the 1980s. That was the last four-wheel drive truck I had until this one. This one, you turn a little knob, like click. And the guy said, oh, you can change it to four-wheel drive it up to 60 miles an hour. In the old days, if you did that, your, your uh, front end would end up at the back somewhere. Actually, it wouldn't go in. It'd just go, until you slowed down, right? So I'm discovering all these uh, things, and then... I noticed that there's a little, uh, I didn't understand the symbolism on the side of the knob. And I said, well, I see four high, four low, two-wheel drive. Well, what is this? He said, that, my friend, is the positive traction. So you pull that little button out. Who, who know, I mean, y'all car people know what positive traction is. So, so if you don't have positive traction, it's only one wheel will spin at a time on your car on the back. So if you get in a tight, one wheel will spin, and the other one's sitting still, not doing its job. So you just pull this little button, and now you've really got two-wheel drive instead of one-wheel drive. And I'm thinking, I wonder how much there is to this truck that I don't understand yet. I mean, it has been equipped beyond my education. And, and, uh, and I haven't even really delved into the electronic system of it and all the things. I'm pretty sure that it can tell you where to go. I mean, you know, like, <laughs> tell you how to get there. People in the back seat will tell you where to go. I'm pretty sure it's got all these, it's got that, it's got that satellite radio that's supposed to be awesome, but for some reason it don't work under my carport. Yeah, it just don't work under the carport or in caves. I haven't been in a cave yet, but I'm assuming that. The, um, but I've found all these options on it, and, and as usual, the Lord uses, I'm a simple person, so the Lord gives me simple lessons. And while I was thinking about that, he said, there's things that I've given you that you don't even know how to twist the knob yet or pull the button. But this is what he told me, and this is basically what I'm speaking about today. He said, I have fully equipped all of my children to completely accomplish every dream that they have that I've given them. Fully equipped. Say, I'm fully equipped. I had a thing about that. I went, wow, so you can, have, you can be fully equipped for something and never realize it. Uh, there was a, um, a truck for sale that Ryan over here purchased. And when, he, when they got, I guess his mom went and picked it up. And when she went and picked it up, she hit the button in the, in the truck. I guess it remotely started. And the guy goes, wow, I didn't even know it did that. The guy that had the truck how long? Didn't even know he had a remote start on it. A couple of years. <laughs> remote start. The, I mean, they're beautiful because like, we had a guy in Lake Placid at my old church, had a remote start, and so when the pastor said, let's all stand to pray, he went, click, mm, and his truck cranked out front, and the air conditioner's running. So we're all getting our cars rolling down the windows, fanning out the heat. He gets in, there's icebergs hanging. This guy had it the whole time, didn't even know it. I had positive traction the whole time. I've been, I've been going through the effort of turning it to four-wheel drive when I could have pulled it for positive traction. I know that doesn't sound very like a lot. But I just, when, I, when the Lord began to talk to me about this, I began to think, how many things in our lives do we make hard because we don't realize we're equipped? And I, there's a, there is a secret to finding out what your vehicle's equipped with, and it's hopefully in your glove box. And it is called a, a manual, and it's produced by the people who built the vehicle. And it's amazing. I mean, I was able to change the lock code on the door in like 30 seconds. Because I read the manual. I was able to discover a few other things about my vehicle just by reading the manual. And, you know, uh, anybody that creates anything new, they have to create a manual so people can learn how to use it. And that's really the only reason people need high educations is to be able to read manuals that other people write. That's the only reason. You, I mean, it's the only reason because they make things so, um, they make things so uh, difficult to understand. You, that you, who's had a problem ever putting their seatbelt in before? Yeah, it's difficult. If you grab the wrong one, it won't click. I fought that thing for 15 minutes one time years ago. 
what in the world's wrong with this thing? It's not working. It's the wrong, it's the wrong one. Why? They, I don't know why they did it like that. Uh, just to confuse us. But then you dig down, you find the right one, all of a sudden it works. Well, if I'd have read the manual, I'd have found it. Now, there's going to be a lot of things um, in our life that I'm convinced, hopefully not as many as we move forward, but I think there's a lot of things right now that we have just no idea, none, that God has equipped us in the way that he has equipped us. And the reason we, we have a hard time with it is because we just glance over the manual that he's given us and we just go to the parts that we need. Like the fuse page. Who knows what I'm talking about? The fuse page is like the part, that's where you crease it or in the old days, right? In the old days, I mean, I mean in the 90s. Because fuses would blow, so you'd have to find the fuse, right? Because they ride them under there, but you gotta you got to have a neck like a giraffe to be able to get your head under the car and a flashlight to be able to see which one's which, but you can open up that little magic book, and there they are. So every car you know, in the 80s and 90s, you open it, it just falls open to the fuse page. But there's a lot more in that book than that. And I love, when, when we buy things, I love getting out the manuals and just reading it so I can find all, I do that. I do that with my, my phones, my watches. I just read all the little cool things they do, and I don't remember most of them. Why? Because I haven't given enough attention to them. And, and you, may be a, you may say, well, I've read the whole Bible. There's a difference in reading through the manual and understanding and knowing the manual. I want to start this morning in one of my favorite of the two books. is Second Timothy. Favorite two books in the Bible, First Timothy, Second Timothy. It's interesting to me because Timothy was a young pastor, and I was a young pastor, and now a middle-aged pastor. But uh, Timothy was a young pastor, and his grandmother's name was Lois, Lois, and that was my grandmother's name. And he had a Paul, and I had a Paul over me that taught me in ministry. And I, I, there's times in my life that I'll just read the entire First and Second Timothy every day just to get reacquainted with what's in there. But it's in Second Timothy 3.16. It's easy to remember. How many of you know John 3.16? Okay, Second Timothy, there's a lot of 3.16s that are really cool, but Second Timothy 3.16 is a really good one, and it talks about the Word of God. Okay? So let's get right into it. We're going to read the Word about the Word. All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. Verse 17, so that, so that, I don't see verse 17 yet. Da, 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 da. Sorry, I probably didn't tell them to do it. They're going to get it up there, though, because I don't want to go past this. Let's start over. All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, and it's there for a reason. But you can't find out yet because verse 17 isn't up there. Who's got their Bibles open to 3, 16, and 17? There you go. For what purpose? I want you to see this. So that the man of God may be complete and proficient well fitted and thoroughly equipped for every good work. So that you and I will be complete. The Word of God. So that you and I will become proficient. The Word of God. So that we will be well fitted and thoroughly equipped for every good work. Every. Everybody say every. Every good work. So in other words, we are fully equipped. We are the container that holds the revelation. God has provided the revelation, and he says, fill up your container with the revelation so that you can be complete, proficient, well-fitted, and thoroughly equipped so that you can then do the works of God. Now, here's what's interesting about this that I want to talk about for just a moment. When I read this most of my life, I read it in verse 16, the Word of God is there to reprove, to correct, for training in righteousness. All I thought about was God's words there to correct me. All the time, every time I have the wrong thought or I do the wrong thing, it's just right there to go wrong, you know, wrong, get slapped down. How many of you ever felt that way? You read the Bible and you get done, you're bruised and beat up, and you go, my goodness, I'm never going to make it. And, and some people, because they're just honest with themselves, say there's no way I could ever do this, so they put the Bible away and go, it's, it's impossible, I can't do it. There's a lot of people that aren't in church because of that today. But let me tell you what this scripture is 
saying that goes much deeper than correcting our actions. Everything we read here, the teaching, the reproof, the correction, and the training in righteousness, all of this occurs in our minds. Are you getting it? Teaching our minds, reproofing our minds, correcting our minds, and training our minds as to who we are in Jesus Christ. See, whatever you think about yourself is what you are, because it's what you do. If you follow most people that grew up in poverty, their children remain in poverty because it's the way they view themselves. So everything they gather around them, they look at as, a, as, a, as this is going to keep them in poverty. In order for a person to move from poverty to a prosperity mindset, or a, I, I, I kind of like to stay away from, the, away from the word prosperity because of the way it has been, uh, uh, been used incorrectly. But I guess we could, we could say the word um, uh, supplied, the supply of heaven. Uh, let me, let's real quick, how many of you know that the Bible says, my God shall supply according to, oh, Lord. Okay, now, okay, now we all, how many of y'all believe that? Raise your hand. How many of you have worried about money in the last month? Why, why aren't you raising your hands? Because I know that's not true. You're embarrassed, I know, it's okay. Well, what do you mean? Oh, you just said you believed what that said. But yet, you, admit, you have to admit to yourself that it, maybe not in the last month, but how about the last year? Who's had a money concern in the last year? Raise your hand. There we go. Now, you just said you believed it. Well, see, there's a difference, and I think we all know this, but I'm going to repeat it. There's a difference between mentally agreeing with something and having an understanding of it. Because if, if, when this becomes a revelation, when that word becomes a living revelation, it then changes the way we view things. So every financial problem we look at as a potential explosion of blessing instead of, here we go again. We look at it as an opportunity for God to show up and show out instead of an opportunity for the enemy to get one more kick on us. And because we view it the wrong way, our results follow the way we think. As a man thinketh, so is he. You think you're poor, you'll be poor. But you take somebody who's been raised in a, in a wealthy family, and, and it was interesting to me, and I didn't understand this, I grew up with some wealthy, wealthy families, right? They all drove trucks like mine when they were 15, 16 years old. And that's how I defined wealthy in my day. If your daddy bought you a brand new four-wheel drive big truck, then you were wealthy, and you were 16, and you, I was jealous of you, and I wish I could have one. Instead, I'm driving around in my old barely running, you know, truck that I had. And I'm like, he hadn't paid his dues, you know, blah, 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 he won't respect work. And uh, he's just going to live off his daddy. Who's ever thought that about people? But y'all be, is it only me? But here's what's interesting. Now that I am 47 years old, and I look back at some of these very same people, did you know most of them are not making money in their parents' companies? Most of them started their own stinking companies. I'm like, what are you doing? You, your daddy owns half the county. Like, I'm not, no, I want to be a doctor. No, I want to do this. I want to start my own business. I want to go do this. Why? Because in them, they are bred to succeed. They are... That's the way they think. They think successfully. And when they grew up, they didn't sit around wondering how they're going to pay the bills, like most of us did. So if we, were, if we were raised in a situation that has our mind warped to the reality of what Jesus has done for us, there's only one way to fix what we, the way we've been thinking, and that is to let the Word of God, come on, become so real to us that the shift happens and when that shift, who knows what I'm talking about, that shift, uh, you experience that shift, it becomes a revelation instead of just a believing. It literally, I can remember the shift that happened in me when I understood grace. I, could, I mean, I was in my office, I read it. I could take you to the page I read, I could take you to the tree I stood out under, and I could tell you where the tears ran down my face, and my hands went up to heaven, and I understood for the first time, I had a revelation that what I do does not determine who I am. It was a shift. It was a revelation. When that happens, then everything changes. And that's what the Word of God will do if we will stay with that Word. So we all read that, we said that scripture a moment ago about how that He supplied all our needs, right? 
Well, why is it that we don't have that revelation inside of us? Because we mix it with other words that are feeding our intellect. Well, I don't have enough money. I'm going to be broke. We need to count our, our, we need to count our coins. We need to make sure we got enough. We need to quit doing this. We need to start doing that. You hear what I'm saying? And what happens is, is our mind gets a mixed signal. And when it gets a mixed signal, it cannot receive anything from God. The mind has to be fixed to accomplish anything. It has to be fixed. I knew for years Jesus died for my sins. I knew that. I would have fought you for it. I'd have died for it. I'd have, if they'd have put a gun to him, I'd have said Jesus died for my sin. But I didn't have a revelation of salvation until October the 7th of 1992. And when that happened, a shift happened in the way I think. And I've never, ever, ever questioned since that day I belong to him. Who remembers that shift happening to you? Why? Because now I understood something. Instead of just believing it because I've heard it, I, instead of having a mixed thought life, now I have a secure thought life. So there are things that we all, all are secure in. But there's some other things that we're not so sure about. And in that, we have a mixed mindset. And a mixed mindset is unstable in all its ways. And the scripture says, let that man think that he will receive. Let him not think he'll receive anything from the Lord. Because an, unst an unstable mind is unstable in all his ways. He's beat back and forth like a boat on the ocean. The kingdom of God and the realities of the kingdom are more about a, they are a mindset more than they are anything else. We talked about this last week, how you can come into a room and if you have the right thoughts about yourself and the right thoughts, you can change the atmosphere of the room. A person that walks in authority, that knows they have authority in the room, they change it. A person that does, you know that. You've been, if you've ever been stopped a bunch by police officers, which I was, and I figured it was better to join them than to fight them, so I became one, I could tell the difference in the guy that, I, that, that was secure in who he was and the guy who was new. Because the guy who was new would be kind of fumbling around. Can you, the training wasn't as good back then. Now it's a little harder to tell. He'd be fumbling around. You know, you could tell he's a little nervous with his traffic stop. But you, you get one of them old guys. He said, boy, sit down in that car. Same uniform, same badge, different attitude. And you're thinking, he will beat me. And he don't even care if it's legal. Right? He knows my daddy, and my daddy wouldn't care if he beat me. How many of y'all grew up like that? <laughs> daddy would be like, beat him, and then send him home. Send him home, because when when, boy, when he gets done with you, I'm going to beat you. I, aren't you glad that we ain't like that today? My God, I don't nobody beat my children. I'll take care of my children. I don't need nobody to beat them. But in them days, they thought they could beat the bad out of you. Listen, they, you cannot beat bad out of people. All you can do is get them to hide it better. I was beat. I was <laughs> I just got to be sneaky. Oh boy, I could lie. Natural born liar. If I wanted to, I could lie to you and you would go to court and, and, and fight for my right and you'd think I was telling the truth. I was that accomplished at lying. Why? Because I got beat. But you know what? Nothing changed in my heart. I didn't get understanding. I just got beat. Now, the good thing is that as I got beat, it did keep me out of prison. I'm going to have to say amen to that. Well, not because I was afraid of prison. I was afraid of daddy. And I figured they're going to let me out eventually. <laughs> in the, in, we're not going to turn there, but in Mark chapter 12, the, the scribes of the Pharisees, they're trying to corner Jesus, right? And they're always trying to corner him with some theology. And... Um, one of them says to him, one of the teachers, they say to him, what is the greatest commandment? Right? And Jesus quotes our billboard out front. Loving God, loving people, basically. For the Lord is one, and you shall love him with all your heart, your soul, and all your mind. And the second is as great, love your neighbor as yourself. Well, the Pharisee that asked him that question said, you have spoken correctly. Now, this guy was trying to trap Jesus. Now he said, you know what? That's right. That's right, because all the burnt sacrifices and everything we do do not measure up to those two commands. And it says Jesus looked at him and said, you're not far from the kingdom. Now, here's my question to you. In proximity, in distance, weren't they all the same distance from the kingdom? Because Jesus was in the kingdom. The kingdom was right there. So, 
Jesus was saying, you're not far from the kingdom in the way you're thinking. The way you're thinking is not far from the kingdom. And it says that in Mark chapter 12, that he perceived that he understood something. And he said, hey, you are close to the clicking, to the turning, to the revelation. You're very close. I'm telling you this this morning because for years... I tried to align with the kingdom through my actions. It doesn't work. Because if we had a clue on how straight the kingdom and how holy the kingdom is, we would have quit trying from day one. It's just, he is too holy. His ways are above our ways. His thoughts are above our thoughts, and his, his law is too wonderful to comprehend. He is perfect. But yet, I as well, or as, as you most likely, spent a good portion of my life trying to line myself up to the, to the kingdom through my actions. And I'd, get, I'd hear all my life getting preached, you better repent! Turn and ch- do something different. That's what repent means. And then one day I looked it up for myself and I found out that's not what it means. Repent has nothing to do with doing at all. Repent has to do with thinking. John the Baptist shows up. He says, the kingdom of God is at hand. Time to repent. I wish the translators would have said it the way we understand it. Hey, the kingdom is appearing. It's time to change the way you think. Repent of your sins. Think about your sins differently. Because in their culture, they thought about their sins as they did something to get cleansed. And they say, no, you're going to have to go to a whole new level of thinking now because there is a Savior coming, come on, who's going to do something that gets you cleansed. And that's going to require you repenting about sin. You've got to think differently about sin. You've got to see that you are hopeless, that you are a lost cause, and without someone coming along that is perfect, you will never measure up. And that's what John was preaching to them. So basically, when he baptized them, they were baptized saying, I give up. That was a baptism of, I can't do it. That's what it was. It wasn't a baptism to get them ready for, it was getting them ready for Jesus, because to get ready for Jesus, you've got to come to the end of yourself, which means you've got to give up. But all my life, I thought they were like cleansing like part of the sin off. You know, getting them ready, getting them kind of halfway clean, you know, getting new clothes on them, getting, how many of y'all thought that? I, I was what I really thought, that I thought the repentance of, of dead works had everything to what they were doing instead of what the way they were thinking. He was baptizing them into a new reality that they were in need of a Savior. It was the voice in the wilderness. In Psalm 119, verse 130, this is what the psalmist said. The unfolding of your word gives light. We talked about that last week. And it gives understanding to Remember earlier I said, I'm a simple man? His word gives understanding to Tim Williams. It gives me understanding. But see, it's not the reading of the word, it's the unfolding of the word. What does that mean? That means the digging into the word until it becomes such a part of us that we no longer are slanted talkers. One, way, one day we're saying one thing, one day we're saying the next thing. I want you to, I want you to listen to me with my heart for this, okay? I, I don't want you to take any, I don't want you to get offended. Blessed are those who are not easily offended. Because probably you've done this. I know I've done it. And I've heard it so much that I can't even remember how many times where someone will say I am healed as long as there are other Christians around but as soon as they get home I'm not I'm I'm sick talk to their doctors I'm sick what are they doing they're sending they're sending mixed signals to their mind I keep saying I'm healed yeah but you keep also saying that you're struggling I keep saying I'm blessed, but you also keep saying 
You had a bad day. You know, I, I keep saying my children are come to the Lord. Yeah, but you also keep saying they're a bunch of heathens. <laughs> or pagans, however you want to say it. So the unfolding of the Word means that we spend enough time in that Word till we start believing it. I worked with a guy that was the, he was the biggest liar. He would lie about things of no consequence. You could say, what would you have for lunch today? He'd say, I went to Taco Bell. And you know good and well he went to Wendy's. <laughs> now why would you lie about going to Taco Bell? I guess because that's what, he's truly one of the only people I know, I only know about three that I would say they are a liar by trade. <laughs> they just lie. And I was, I, was, I was confounded by this because I didn't understand why you would lie about things that didn't matter. I can understand lying in a hot, at a hot spot. Who, we've all done that. You know, everybody, there ain't nobody in here has been truthful all the time. None of you. Right? Enough trouble comes along. You say, I won't lie. Yeah, well, well I don't know. I, don't, I mean, I don't know. You mean, enough pressure comes, enough pain I'm not going to say I won't ever lie. I can say this, though. Jesus will never lie. <laughs> so therefore, I'm not a liar because I'm in him. <laughs> but you know what they told me about liars? I don't know who they are, but you know, they. <laughs> what I've been told about liars is that they say a lie so much they begin to believe it. And I'm thinking, if you can lie enough to believe it, then why can't you take the word of truth and speak it enough till you start believing it? See, you may have been told as a child you were worthless, or you were ugly, or you were fat, or you were unattractive, or you were dumb. And because it was repeated over and over, you began to believe it. So then everything you viewed in life you thought were people were judging you for being ugly, fat, dumb, or stupid. I mean, everything, you took it that way. It didn't matter. You were judging their motives based on how you felt. This destroys marriages. It destroys marriages. Because you got one spouse trying to do everything right, and everything they do right, the other one's taking it wrong. And sometimes, sometimes I've, I've, heard, I've heard men say this. They say to their wives, just tell me what to do. Just tell me what to do. Well, the problem is you can't fix her and she can't fix you. Because it's all about the way they perceive things. It's all about the view they have. And if they think that you don't respect them, then every time you say one thing, they're going to see it as disrespect. So, as we are in the Lord... We have things in our lives that don't line up with what His Word says. So, we have a choice to do, a choice to make. We can, we can either continue with the status quo, which is what most believers do, or we can take this serious and say, you know what, the, the Word of God says this about me, and I know I've been raised being told this, but man, I, I want to believe what this says. So how do I do that? Well, here's how you do it. By letting this get so far and deep inside of us, by speaking over ourselves till eventually, if the lie will seem like the truth, can I just tell you that the truth will seem like the truth if you keep on it long enough? If you don't allow people to down talk to you and don't allow people to speak death into your life, just tell them something like this. If you don't have something good to say, don't say anything at all. Proverbs 2 6 says this For the Lord gives wisdom, and from his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. We don't know ourselves. He knows us. All we know is what we do and what we've been told. But your parents, they may have loved you, but they didn't know you. But the Lord knew you before he made you. He knows you and he knows every possibility that lies inside of you and his will is to unlock all of those so that you can become everything he wants you to be. But listen, as long as our minds are filled with these negative images of ourselves, and we keep believing things that don't line up with the word, then it hinders us from carrying out God's plan. I was, we were singing a song, and I want to I read this to you. I want to talk to you about the difference just before I move on. 
I want to I want to put the final nail into the coffin of of this idea that just because we say something we actually believe it. Just because we mentally agree to something that it's affected the way we do things. Just uh, through you I can do anything. Y'all are all singing. I watch you. Through you, I can do anything. But is that re- do you really believe that? I mean, does, is that really? Do you really believe that? Or do you believe that you have to struggle with some things? Do you really believe it? I mean, that's what the Word says. I'll give you that. But is that what your heart tells you? When you come across a situation that seems impossible, is the first thought that comes to your heart, I can do that, me and Jesus. Absolutely. Or is the first thought come, uh-oh. I'm not sure. Through you I can do anything. I can do all things. Because it's you who gives me strength. I love this one. Y'all were singing. I'm like, y'all don't believe it. I was, I was saying. <laughs> not going to live by what I see. I'm like, y'all sing it real pretty. But how about living it? I need to go home. Do I need to just pack up and go? I mean, I mean, this is the question. Through you, I can do everything. I'm not going to live by what I see. In other words, what I see in the natural is not my conclusion. I'm not going to draw conclusions based on what I see. And I'm not going to live by what I feel. Some of y'all is arguing before you got here this morning with your spouse. Why? Because you're living by what you feel. See, his words are much higher. His thoughts are much higher. But can I tell you, he has equipped us to think the same way. We can get to a place that we can sing this and actually believe it. And it become reality to you. I believe, I believe, I believe in you. I'll leave that one alone. I mean, I could go through all these songs. Uh, but I'm not going to. Instead, I want to get now into the application a little bit in 2 Corinthians. Because it's, 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 um, it's not just enough for me to diagnose a problem. <laughs> you know, doctors say, yeah, we got a real problem here. You got cancer. See you next week. Well, it's not gonna, it's, you're like, no, how about what are we going to do? Well, you have to pay another copay to get that information. And then you say, hey, I'm not going to live by what I see, right? I'm not going to believe by what, live by what I feel. <laughs> okay, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Say with me, the battle is in my mind. Listen, if you can just get that. The battle's in your mind. It's nowhere else. It's right there. It's the way we think, the way we process information, the way we view things, our worldview, what we believe to be true basis on what we just say we believe to be true because really what we believe guides our life whatever you believe about yourself you act that way if you believe that you're insignificant then you will always feel and act insignificant in front of other people if you feel like you have nothing to offer the conversation then you will always withhold and never give into the conversation but once you start realizing that God has made you uniquely wonderful and he has gifted you in all kind of ways and all you have to do is grow in that gifting then you'll become bold and be able to accomplish what God wants you to 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and I'm using the amplified here for though we walk in the flesh as mortal men we are not carrying on our warfare according to the flesh we're not using mere human weapons okay verse 4 For the weapons of our warfare are not physical. They're not weapons of flesh and blood. But they are mighty before God for the overthrow and destruction of strongholds. Next verse. Insomuch as we refute arguments and theories. and Where where do all these happen? Arguments, theories, and reasonings. Where are they happening at? In our mind. So the battle, the battle is going on in the mind. The spiritual battle we're going on is not you out there yelling at demons. It's in your own mind. Every proud and lofty thing that sets itself up against the truth, the word of God. 
right? Like you're fat, you're ugly, you're not pretty, you're insignificant. All those things counter the word of God and they become strongholds in our life. And we lead every thought and purpose away captive into obedience of Christ. In other words, we captivate the right thoughts and we build a stronghold of correct thinking. That's what it comes, that's really what, it's, it's all in the mind. That's the point I was wanting to get to. So let's just back up for just one second. Let's think about what a fortress is, or a, King James calls it a stronghold. That is a, a, a place that has been taken by an occupying force, and they guard it. A lot of times, if, if, a, if, a, if a country, if a nation takes over another nation, they will build their own fortress. They will build it possibly on a high piece of land that is defensible so that they can that they can stop the attackers early on during any kind of military action. They put people on the walls called watch guards or whatever you want to call them, watchmen on the walls, and they look for any sign of any kind of aggression. They also look for, for the Trojan horse kind of thing. They're always looking, they're thinking. They wouldn't have a fortress if they didn't think it would be attacked. Because, I mean, think about it. Why would you need a stronghold or a fortress if there was no threat of an attack? So these lies that the enemy has planted in our lives through our family and through other people and through the way we think about ourselves, we have to understand that these things are strongholds so that anytime you hear a word that contradicts it, your mind, the stronghold in your mind, shoots an arrow down to kill that thing before it can ascend the hill to take the city. So the first thing we've got to understand is that the way we are made, the way God created us is to guard what we believe. But we have been violated. There's been a trespasser in our life, and his name is Satan. Yes. And, and, and because of the fall of man, he came into humankind, and he began to sell lies to us, and he began to lie and lie and lie, and I've said it before, that his kingdom is all built on nothing but lies. And that's why it says the word of God is the sword of the Spirit. Because the Word of God destroys and cuts off at the root the very lies that we hold so dear in our hearts and we don't realize it. We don't realize it. And when someone says to you, for instance, you're a beautiful person, that stronghold in your mind immediately cuts that down and says something like, oh, they're just saying that because they feel sorry for me. They don't really mean it. Or if someone, or if the pastor says, Jesus loves you, that stronghold says, yeah, well, he don't know what I've done. So I'm just going to take those words and throw them out the window. Why? Because the job of the stronghold is to cast down everything that comes against what the stronghold is all about. And so if we don't understand this, then we'll come here a good message, walk out of here, and nothing changes. Uh, you, 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 you know how you got to take a stronghold? With strategy. With force. It's not something you half-heartedly do. It's you, don't, you don't change a mindset any quicker than you take on a city. It has to be continual forward aggression at all times. Using the shield of faith to quench the darts of the enemy that come against our mind. Say, no, this is what the Word says. This is what the Word says. And we keep advancing and we keep advancing. We might get knocked down. So what? Get up. Keep advancing. But understand, we don't take strongholds overnight. I'm talking about living the Christian life in general terms. I'm not talking about the once in a while great miracle that we've all had where something just happens. And praise God for that. I mean, I've seen people get set free from addictions, bam. Just like, but I've also seen people that had to war in their minds against the addiction for years. Same, same battle was won. Here's the problem, though. The person who got the quick miracle is a lot more likely to fall back into it than the guy that fought the battle to get out of it. Are y'all hearing me? Because once you invest time changing the way you think about something and you get the reward of that, which is substance-free living, you think back when you look over at that dope and you think, man, I remember what that stronghold had in my life. I want nothing to do with it. I thank God for quick miracles. I've had them. But I also know I've played around the edge on that mess more than I have the stuff I've had to overcome by faith. 
Are y'all catching my drift? So, these weapons are divinely empowered. What are they? The weapons, they are the Word of God, the thoughts of God, the ways of God. And they are designed to tear down strongholds. So I sat, I, what, you know, my God will supply all my needs according to his riches and glory. That's an advancement. But you know what? I can't just say it once in a while. I've got to continue speaking it to my, and it doesn't really, you, what you say in front of other people, that's not really that big a deal. It's what you say to yourself in the dark of the night. I mean, I can control myself really well up here. I never lose my temper. I never shout. I never get short with my wife when I'm preaching. I never. Y'all have never seen me get short with my wife up here. But I guarantee you I've been short with her, but not up here. Why? Because it's a light of day. I'm much more subdued, much more, which proves I have control. If I can control myself here, I can control myself there. Right? But you think my wife cares what I preach about if I'm mistreating her? You think she cares? Whatever, man. I live with you, right? So that's what I'm saying. It doesn't really matter what you say in public about how you beat something or what. No, it's what you believe in your own heart in the darkness of the night. When that enemy shows up, when you're weak, and you say, you look at the enemy right in the face and you go, Jesus. <laughs> I do it, man. I go, Jesus. Jesus. There's just something. Oh, he can't stand it devil trying to sell you some dope on the side. I'm talking about spiritual dope, although there is natural dope. <laughs> trying, to, trying to get you hooked again on something. You just say, Jesus. <laughs> Verse 5. I want you to notice the word that's used here. We're destroying sophisticated arguments. See, every stronghold in our life is sophisticated. It's not simplistic. If it was simplistic, it would be just a little uh, cabin somewhere, and you could just shoot a couple darts into it with flames of arrows, and you burn it down. But it's not. It's, it's strategically placed there by the enemy to stunt you and to stop you from becoming what God wants you to become. It is stone upon stone, precept upon precept, idea upon idea, that's all confirmed by the way people talk to you, the way people treat you, the way you were raised. All this is putting the mortar in this stronghold, and it is there to stay and it does not want to leave. It is sophisticated. But it is the Word of God that destroys these sophisticated strongholds. It's the Word of God that, ex that destroys these things that have been exalted and these things of pride that are coming against what God says. And that last part, taking every thought and purpose captive to the obedience of Christ. And this is something I have not really thought about. But you can, you can take the Word of God and build a stronghold in your life. So that when anything comes against that way of thinking, arrows come down from the top and you destroy it. Captivating the revelation of God, surrounding yourself with it, and any words that come against it, you say, I don't receive that. I don't take that. Right? And what happens is, naturally it happens. Whatever becomes a stronghold in your life, good or bad, it naturally wards off anything that opposes it. That's right. So here's the good news. The good news is that as you develop into thinking the right way and, and captivating and building a fortress around the right way of thinking, when the wrong way comes, it shoots it down. Yes. It'll stand no chance coming against you. You have a stronger deity on the inside of you than that little weakened liar that runs around on the earth greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world so you tell me which stronghold is the strongest the stronghold of deception and lies or stronghold of truth Jesus walked this out for us he walked it out he believed he believed what the Word said about him. Even though people were saying, I know you, I grew up with you. I know you, you're Bob the Builder's son. Right? Carpenter's boy. That's everybody, we know who you are. Jesus marveled at their unbelief. And he couldn't do many great miracles in his hometown. Because they couldn't believe. They knew him according to the flesh. 
but Jesus knew himself according to the word. So you can either know yourself according to how you've been raised or according to the diplomas on your wall or the size of your bank account or the prettiness of your wife or the greatness of your children or the size of your retirement fund or you can know yourself according to the word of God. Every other kingdom's coming down. Only one kingdom will stand. Only one will remain. And only one can be trusted. And you, brothers and sisters, are members and royalty. You are of the household of faith. And we have been lied to too long. Well, how does this fit in with the current situation of our church where we're beginning to shift how we view the world and now we, we are starting to view ourselves as those who have been called by God to speak redemption into people's lives, to share the faith that we have acquired, to give people hope in a dark world. Why? Because if we don't allow our thinking to change, then we will never move out of the current condition we're in, and we will be subdued when it comes to sharing our faith, and we'll be afraid when it comes to sharing our faith, and we'll be insecure it's going to take a real shift in the way we view ourselves in order to be confident enough to come up to people and talk to them. I'm talking about people you know, people you love, people you work with. I'm not talking about street evangelism. That's a calling on some people. It isn't on everybody. But you know what? We're all called to speak to people we know and that God brings into our life. Every, your, your friends, your family, that is your mission field. Don't give me the excuse. Well, I can't knock on doors. I don't care. How about the door you walk through every day? How about knocking on that one? That one you're responsible for. If God tells you to go knock on a door, bless God to go knock on a door. But see, we can't do that as long as we're believing the lies about ourselves. Every thought. See, the Word of God was given to us because we have been held captive by the enemy. We have ways of thinking because of the captivity of this world that are incorrect. God sent His Son to walk it out and He sent His Word to teach, to reproof, to correct, to challenge our way of thinking and begin tearing down strongholds of the enemy and building the stronghold of faith. And then we can sing this song. Through you, I can do all things. Through you, I can do all things and I'm not going to live by what I see because I'm in touch with the eternal part of me. I'm not going to live by what I feel because what I feel can change. It's subject to change. You know how much easier we'd be to live with if we weren't led around by emotions? I don't have the worship team come up. I want to tell you what Jesus said to the Pharisee, to the scribe that day. You're not far from the kingdom. You're not far from the right thinking in whatever area of your life that you've been struggling. You're not far from it. Just one shift in the way you think. Just one shift. Just one revelation. One word of God becoming active in your life. It'll change everything. You are the light of the world. But if you don't believe it, you'll never shine. You'll be a candle under a bush. Let's all stand together. This is going to be a service where by His grace, strongholds that have produced captivity in our lives can be broken off. Thank you, Jesus. And I usually tell you to go for the biggest thing, but today what I'm going to do is this. I'm, I'm, I feel led by the Holy Spirit for this. I want you to think about a way of thinking in your life that you'd like to change. One that, you, one that isn't really causing you a lot of trouble, but you'd just like to change it. If money's not really trouble for you, then maybe it has to do with money. If health isn't an issue, maybe it has to do with health. 
I don't want you to choose something that's like really like if you got cancer, I don't want you to choose sickness. Got it? Yeah. But if you're like if you're like a pretty healthy person, I want you to choose a stronghold in your life that's been developed in the way you think. So that you can take the word of God and begin to break it down and build a new stronghold. And here's why. When we think about getting out of debt, common sense or just regular thinking says, hit your big debt first, pay it off. But that's scientifically that doesn't work as well as starting with small debt. You take your here's what you do. If you have a lot of debt and you want to pay it off, you take your smallest debt, pay it off. What happens? sense of accomplishment, yeah. a sense that you can do it, it builds strength on the inner person inside of you. So that's why I'm going to talk about this today because the Lord wants us to have right thinking and we need to be encouraged to continue the process. But I'm saying let's start with something small. I heard a guy say one time that he was believing God to have a mindset of, you know, of plenty, a mindset of not lack. A mindset, I, the word I was looking for earlier was not prosperity, but provisional. Right. God provides for us everything we need. That's prosperous to me, but it's, it's just better in today's world to use that word. He's a provider, Jehovah Jireh. And I heard this guy, this preacher one time, he was, saying he was trying to believe God where, where finances were concerned. He had a real stronghold in his life. And um, instead of believing for something big, he just decided he was going to believe for socks. <clears throat> He said, I had socks. I wasn't in real need of socks, but I just said, I'm going to activate my faith concerning socks. So he just said, Father, I just thank you for new socks. Lord, you supply all my needs. You give well above what I need. You're a God of plenty. And I just thank you for blessing me with some socks. He said, for long, people just giving him socks. What did he do? He started with something small. Amen. Yeah. Talking about physical healing, start with something small. Develop your strength on the inner man so today what we're going to do the spiritual exercise that we're going to accomplish today is is you're going to ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you a stronghold in your life that is not ruling you but you know it's there and starting today you're going to use you're going to look it out you're going to search out the Word of God and begin to get rid of that stronghold instead build a new way of thinking until that changes and when you do that I'm telling you to do that because that's easy and you're more likely to do that when you do that you'll see the possibility and the way you'll know your mind's been changed is because the thoughts that used to invoke certain feelings will stop and instead faith will rise up and you'll know so as we worship him and we honor him I don't want you to think about strongholds. I want you to think about Jesus. Okay? And here's what he's going to do. While you're worshiping him, he's going to speak to you about something. He's going to give you an assignment. And then you will know. We're going to move into prayer a little bit later. But for right now, honor him. Worship him. And don't try to hear him. Instead, pour your love out on him. And he wants you free a lot more than you want to be free. Uh -huh. Can I just tell you, you don't want it near as much as he wants it. So he's not going to hold back. If you'll just honor him, he'll speak to your soul before this service is over. And then when we do our prayer time, we'll, stra we'll strategically deal with this in prayer. If you will, just lift your hands. I'll tell you what, all of you that will, come, come forward.